American society. I had the honor to meet and hear Catherine virtually when we were both guests of the Irish Pro-Life USA Global Leadership Forum. When I heard Catherine speak, I knew she was the perfect person to speak during our very first pro-life webinar. Without further ado, I introduce Catherine Glenn Foster. Catherine. Thank you. Uh, good morning, afternoon to you all, depending on what time zone you're in. It is such a privilege to be able to join all of you here. And while 2020 may not have been a typical year with 2021 following right in its footsteps so far, and we've all had to get used to gathering over Zoom like this instead of over a, a mug of coffee or since this is a, an Irish group, maybe even a pint of Guinness. Um, as we've come together to battle this deadly serious virus that's reshaped the world as we know it, I'm also so grateful and inspired by the way that we have leaned in to new technologies in ways that really facilitate the type of gathering that we have today. As you said, I'm Catherine Glenn Foster, President and CEO of Americans United for Life. I am proud to lead Americans United for Life, America's original national pro-life group, a nonpartisan, nonprofit force for life in America and around the world. We were founded two years before Roe v. Wade struck down the state's good life-affirming pro-life laws. And for coming up on 50 years now, we have fought for the rights of mothers and their children, born and pre-born, across parliaments and congresses and state houses and courtrooms in capitals and communities across our nation and throughout the world. Passing and defending laws to protect women and babies and educating people on just how abhorrent abortion is and why we need these types of protective laws and Americans United for Life's 60 model bills ready to be adapted and passed, protecting all life from conception to natural death. I am a constitutional attorney, a mother and a post-abortive woman. And I know firsthand that fight for the human right to life, for the sanctity of human life, that this is truly the fight of our generation. But I'd like to take us back just a few years to the summer of 1858. Back then, then future President Abraham Lincoln stood up to speak on the most pressing human rights issue of his day, the abomination of slavery. He said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. The United States of America we are at a crossroads, a point of divergence so significant as to rival that tumultuous period of the 1850s. And while I do trust that the truth and justice of our cause will win our fellow Americans to solidarity in defending life, it is nonetheless our responsibility to seize our moment in history. It is time for victory, just like the abolitionists of the 19th century, the suffragettes of the early 20th century, and the civil rights advocates of the latter 20th century. Our mission is to win the hearts and the minds of the American people in the name of human life. Because while laws are absolutely critical in the fight for life, it's not just about laws. It takes all of us contributing in all of our unique ways to establish a culture of life. Because law and policy victories, they flow downstream from establishing the truth that is inherent all around us of the value and dignity possessed by each and every person. We are all human. We are all special. We all matter. At the end of the day, the pernicious ideology of abortion is about one thing, dehumanization. Since the dawn of civilization, persecution has been based on the lie that there is a disruption in our common humanity. If one class is so different from us, are they really human at all? If they're not really human, then people think, then they certainly are not obliged to receive human rights. And then once that ideology is embraced, it is impossible to equally apply the basic human rights endowed to us by our creator. That is what has happened to the preborn. They have been dehumanized 
to a point where they are closer to animals or a science experiment for some people than the real existing human beings that they are. Children in the womb, they're, they're young, sure. But since when does age confer human rights? Children in the womb are dependent on others. But since when does self-sufficiency confer human rights? These precious, unique, wonderfully created human beings deserve human rights because they are human, full stop, as every human being does. Our failure to recognize those rights doesn't make them disappear. Abortion doesn't contribute to women's happiness. And no matter what a misguided Supreme Court may think, abortion isn't necessary for women to succeed. If we were to accept the status quo on abortion, we would be raising the white flag, throwing in the towel, saying that we're giving up the fight for true equality, for communities that support and empower women and girls. Now, tragically, some politicians have already thrown in the towel. In the state of California, the law protects dogs, cats, and other animals from subpar veterinary clinics with an array of 158 separate laws, including training requirements for vets and staff, physical clinic standards, and basic sanitation. On the other hand, California law provides no standards whatsoever to protect women undergoing abortion from dirty and dangerous abortion businesses. That's because every single one of the medical standards that used to protect California women, they've been wiped off the books by state courts and pro-abortion lawmakers. Common sense requirements like ensuring availability of staff for follow-up care and a recovery area adequate for the number of patients recovering at any given time, those were struck from the books in 2014. That was too much for them? A recovery area big enough for the girls currently in the clinic? It's as basic as making sure that you have enough life rafts on the Titanic. What a searing indictment of our values that in California and many other places in America, we treat our animals with so much more care and protection than we do mothers and young children. That's unacceptable, it's reprehensible, but that is our current reality. And I've attended global pro-abortion conferences undercover where abortion activist lawyers have strategized how to tear down common sense protection for women and children in every single nation in the world, one by one. We saw that play out in Ireland just a couple of years ago with the 2018 referendum passing the 36th Amendment to the Irish Constitution, repealing 1983's Eighth Amendment, which we at AUL were proud to work on both back in 1983 and in 2018, standing alongside strong Irish allies. We continue to see the struggle over the lives of our youngest brothers and sisters in Argentina and Poland and in other nations around the world under attack from radical pro-abortion activists and pro-choice ideologues. Indeed, the abortion industry here in the US and around the world, they have bet everything on a strategy of total repeal of common sense abortion laws, believing against the evidence that abortion would be safe if it were just made legal. America's women lost that bet big time when the Supreme Court struck down abortion laws in all 50 states in Roe v. Wade. The documented record of the consequences of this hubris, it's tragic. 1,200 health and safety violations reported in just the last decade and even limited inspections, implicating well over 300 abortion centers in hazardous, unclean abortions. Not to mention the colossal toll that abortion has extracted in human lives and in the physical and emotional suffering of survivors. No one is spared from the horror of abortion, and the data bears that out. My team's deep 50-state investigation, just days now away from publication and the groundbreaking expose unsafe, it exposes abortion businesses that have been operating without a license, that have been using untrained, unlicensed, unqualified abortionists and staff, repeatedly fined for filthy conditions and dangerously mishandling narcotics, and other drugs. As it has since the days before Roe in 1973, the abortion industry operates as if the laws regulating abortion simply don't exist. It's our job to stop that. And one of the reports that I, I just can't stop thinking about comes from Planned Parenthood in Birmingham, Alabama, 
from 2014. A state health violation report tells us the story of a little girl, only 14 years old. And it really hits home for me because my own daughter, Hannah, is just days past her own 14th birthday. She turned 14 on January 12th. And when this little girl in Birmingham went into Planned Parenthood, she already had two living children. Planned Parenthood aborted her third child. Did they at least report suspected sexual abuse to the authorities? No. They sent her right back into what we can only assume was an abusive situation. And then, tragically, if not surprisingly, just four months later, this same little girl came in again and Planned Parenthood performed another abortion. No questions asked. Once again, no suspected abuse was reported and this young girl got no help. Just Planned Parenthood repeatedly performing an abortion, taking her money and sending her on away twice in four months. And during this child's second abortion, seven of these 16 mandated health and legal records were missing or incomplete. Now, we don't know this little girl's story. We don't know her circumstances. We, we don't even know her name. But we do know that she was a 14-year-old little girl in an extremely vulnerable situation, a situation in which we have laws governing how she should be treated. And yet, instead of alerting the authorities to possible and common sense would dictate likely abuse, Planned Parenthood happily cashed her check and looked the other way. That is the abortion industry encapsulated. And those horrors are the tip of the iceberg. The truth is sobering. But by exposing the ugly underside of the abortion cartel, the dirty and dangerous conditions, pro-life advocates can effectively put the lie to abortion industry claims that abortion is a routine, quote unquote, safe medical procedure. That's why we do what we do at Americans United for Life, drafting laws that will pass constitutional muster and stand the test of time, protecting women and babies from an industry that cares more about money than about wiping down the table between patients. I know that firsthand because when I was 19 years old, I walked through the doors of an abortion business. I had never really thought much abortion until it confronted me personally. I had, I had heard the terms pro-life, pro-choice a couple of times, but that word abortion was almost unspoken in my community. And I didn't know what it was until as a sophomore at a little college in Georgia, just back from Christmas break, I found myself unexpectedly pregnant and I had no idea where to turn. I didn't know that there was a pro-life movement, didn't know what help was out there. I had no idea where to go for non-judgmental care. I'm thinking, what do I do? Where do I go? I needed someone to say, who do you need to call? What can we do to help you? Let me, let me hold your hand. We'll find you resources. You're strong enough, you're smart enough, you can do it. All of those things that now, I know that I would say to a woman, those things that embody the care that, that pregnancy centers and sidewalk advocates offer to women who felt like I did. But that night, the night I found out, I turned to the internet and what I found online was abortion facilities. They were the first things that popped up. Praise God that nowadays when a woman, a girl Googles abortion, frequently the first thing that pops up is a life affirming pregnancy center. But that Saturday, that day I made an appointment and I made it for, for that Saturday just a few days later because I didn't know for sure what I would do, but I did know that if I did end up getting an abortion, it would have to be fast because I was already bonding with my child. I remember that week vividly. I was wearing my boyfriend's oversized sweatshirt and I was actually talking with my baby as I walked around campus. I named her, but I opened the doors of that abortion business. And from the moment I walked in, nothing felt right. Nothing restored my choice, my autonomy, my sense of empowerment. It was just stripped from me over and over and over by everything that happened behind those closed doors. I asked questions in the abortion facility, but it was this repeating cycle of questions and not getting answers and not being given real information. First you pay and, and then all of a sudden you're given a pill and they're doing the ultrasound. And, and I said, well, can I see it? Can I see the ultrasound? I wanna see it. I'm still trying to make a decision here. 
And they said, no, we, we don't do that. Of course, we know why ultrasounds save lives. And today I am proud to say that in more and more states every year, it's against the law not to let women see our ultrasounds and not to give us the information that we're asking for. But back in Georgia, back when I was 19, I didn't get to see it. And they moved me from the ultrasound room to the actual abortion room. And I was lying on the table and I changed my mind. I knew, I knew that it was a life. And I tried to get up. I said, let me go. You can keep the money, but this is, this is just wrong for me. I felt it. I felt it in my heart and in my soul that I couldn't go through with it. And what did they do? They shouted for backup. And in the end, I had a worker holding each arm, a worker holding each leg. And they held me down and forcibly aborted my baby. I could feel this indescribable pain. I knew what was happening. It felt like a soul being ripped out of me. I was sobbing, screaming, and they were trying to cover my mouth to make me shut up. And then it was over. I was the last patient to leave the clinic alive that day. I didn't want to leave. I knew it would be the last time I'd be with my baby. My boyfriend drove me back to college an hour and a half or so away. And I just, I remember lying in bed for days, not wanting to move, not knowing how to go on. It was so incredibly traumatic. And that is the story of abortion across America. I've met, I've represented so many women with similar stories. But it is through the absolutely vital work of sidewalk counselors and of life-affirming pregnancy centers, of all of us working together that we, the pro-life community, provide an alternative to the degrading, inhumane, unacceptable status quo of the abortion business. Meeting women where they are, answering their needs and offering truly holistic care so that women are empowered to choose hope and choose life. It is up to all of us to build a bridge with women and girls and partners and communities. Building these real connections, it's one of the most critical things that we can all do for each other, especially when people are hurting or struggling. For women and families in turmoil in the face of an unplanned pregnancy, an ear to listen, a sounding board, a helping hand, maybe even a shoulder to cry on sometimes. That's imperative to helping them think through their options and ultimately making a choice for life. That's the thing I needed most. Being a mom, let's be honest, it's, it's always a challenge, but when you feel like you have no support, it can seem impossible. And so encouragement can mean the difference between life and death. Being a positive force in the life of a friend can be, can be the light in the darkness that they need to make the right choice. We are building a culture of life in our communities and in our nation. I believe that we are truly at a watershed moment to change everything for the better. A time when we can truly protect life, both in America and across the world. With the elevation of Justice Amy Coney Barrett, we now have a solid pro-life majority on the US Supreme Court. And that means that state legislators across America who are already overwhelmingly pro-life, they're going to have the chance to pass meaningful community protections for the pre-born and their mothers that aren't just automatically, immediately going to be struck down by activist pro-abortion federal courts. This day, this opportunity has been a long time coming. Indeed, since 1992, when the Supreme Court affirmed that states do have the constitutional authority to regulate abortion in that Planned Parenthood v. Casey case, the Supreme Court began to undo the damage that Roe v. Wade had done by nullifying the abortion regulations of 49 states back in 1973. We had a setback in the Supreme Court in 2016, but last year, the court indicated that it is ready for states to pass more and more protective life-affirming bills into law. And boy, are they. On average, 60 a year over the last decade, close to half of all the pro-life laws passed over the last 50 years. And we are seeing the fruits of those pro-life laws and of sidewalk advocacy and of life-affirming pregnancy centers and honest conversations with family and friends. Because since 1992, since that Casey case, the abortion rate in America has plummeted by nearly half, saving millions of innocent lives. It is now at the lowest rate it has been since before Roe v. Wade, before abortion was legal in all 50 states, 
And for me, that is, that's just mind blowing, to be honest. And Americans United for Life, we have been a key player in this historic life-saving mission as the majority of state legislation protecting infants and mothers from abortion has been conceived and drafted by our legal experts and then passed by state lawmakers working hand in hand with, with our legal team and with local advocates like everyone joining us here today. And then we track those, those victories and sometimes those defeats in our annual book, Defending Life. Then once those measures are enacted into law, we work with state attorneys general to defend them in court against lawsuits by Planned Parenthood, the ACLU and the Center for Reproductive Rights who seek to tear down these legal protections for women and infants in the womb and to relegate America to a regime of unregulated but constitutionally protected back alley abortion that is highly dangerous for mothers and deadly for infants. That's what we expose in unsafe. That's what we fight against. And it's a fight that we are winning month by month and hour by hour on the front lines and in our nation's courts. Now, 2020 was a little bit different. Many state legislatures shut down early due to coronavirus. So many good pro-life bills were introduced but never saw the light of day due to another threat to life, the coronavirus pandemic. We continue to fight late-term abortions, taxpayer funding of abortions, and so many more issues. But we still saw 19, and I apologize, I have a couple of children coming here and um, getting cereal. Um, yes, go ahead. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Apologies. Um, so we continue to fight these late-term abortions. One quick second. So sorry, everyone. <laughs> this is what happens on the Saturday morning in my household. Um, so, uh, so we saw state legislatures continuing to, to try to introduce pro-life bills, but, um, but because of coronavirus, so many state legislatures did have to shut down early. And so we're continuing to fight these, these late-term abortions and taxpayer funding of abortions and so many more issues. But even in the, in the day of coronavirus, we still saw 19 pro-life laws and resolutions enacted and pro-abortion measures defeated in Maryland and New Hampshire. We are on the right side of history, fighting for truth and justice, fighting for the rights of the most vulnerable and the, the marginalized members of our communities. And we are winning slowly but surely. In the US, a majority of even self-described pro-choice people oppose late-term abortions when five-month-old or even older babies can survive outside the womb and can feel pain when the abortion is, is ever more dangerous and even deadly for women. And a majority of even self-described pro-choice people support common sense protections for mothers and babies. More and more young people are looking for consistency and are supporting life. Make no mistake, we're making progress for life in our laws, in the abortion rate, and in the hearts and minds of our peoples. Now, I won't pretend that the next couple of years will be easy. Starting this month, as we learned just a few minutes ago, the in-person March for Life here in Washington, D.C. has been canceled and converted into a virtual event, as organizers announced in light of the fact that we're in the midst of a pandemic that may be peaking, and in view of the heightened pressures that law enforcement officers and others are currently facing in and around the Capitol. There will just be a small group of pro-life leaders from across the country who will still march to represent pro-life Americans everywhere, who each in their own unique ways work to make abortion unthinkable and build a culture where every human life is valued and protected. But virtually every event around the time of the march has either been canceled or converted to a virtual event. And when we look at the incoming administration, the incoming Senate, with a vice president who proclaimed that if she were elected, she would mandate that every state trying to pass a good pro-life law would first have to get permission for it from her administration. A vice president who selectively prosecuted our dear friend David Delayden for his heroic work, exposing the truth about the abortion industry selling aborted children for profit. That's horrifying. We know that the administration is likely to roll back protections for conscience rights of people who do not want to pay for, participate in, or perform abortions, likely to end the Title X family program requirement that under the Trump administration required recipients not to co-locate with abortion clinics or to promote abortion, likely to eliminate what few restrictions there are 
on distributing chemical abortion pills and drugs and likely to loosen restrictions on fetal tissue research. We're likely to see US taxpayer funding for the promotion and performance of abortions around the world, what you could term abortion colonialism. And we could see a push for abortion funding at home as well with a reinterpretation or even push for Congress to repeal the Hyde Amendment, which prohibits the use of US taxpayer dollars to fund abortion here at home. And I would note again that abortion funding is opposed by a supermajority of Americans of both political parties, including self-described pro-choice Americans. And as we start the 117th Congress, Democrats will control both the House and the Senate by the slimmest of majorities. Even with that small Democrat majority in the House and that equally divided Senate, we expect to see a push for pro-abortion, anti-life legislation potentially trying to codify funding for abortion or even Roe itself. But there is nonetheless good news. Most of our pro-life gains, most of the lives that we've saved over the last 50 years, they've been thanks to laws and efforts closer to home in the states. And a majority of states will be passing pro-life laws this year, many of them with new or strengthened pro-life trifectas in their administration, Senate and House. We saw particularly momentous pro-life gains in Kansas, Kentucky, Montana, New Hampshire, West Virginia, and Wyoming. And so we will continue the fight where it has always been, where we can have the advantage in the state houses. We will continue to press our case in court and we will not neglect the federal government making inroads where we can, especially since we also saw an unprecedented number of pro-life women newly elected to the US House of Representatives. Even in these tough times, we will make real progress. We will save lives and our abortion rate will continue to plummet. As President Lincoln proclaimed, we will become all one thing or all the other. He stirs our souls in this very moment saying, we did this under the single impulse of resistance to a common danger with every external circumstance against us of strange discordant and even hostile elements. We gathered from the four winds and formed and fought the battle through under the constant hot fire of a disciplined, proud and pampered enemy. Sounds a lot like Planned Parenthood, doesn't it? Did we brave all to falter now, now, when that same enemy is wavering, dissevered and belligerent? He means they're losing. <laughs> Back to Lincoln. The result is not doubtful. We shall not fail. If we stand firm, we shall not fail. Wise counsels may accelerate or mistakes delay it, but sooner or later, the victory is sure to come. We must not falter now. History has its eyes on us. So what will we choose? As Rascal Flatts, the, the musical band put it this way in, in their recent song, you're gonna leave a legacy no matter what you do. It ain't a question of if they will, it's how they remember you. What will be our legacy? The legacy of our generation? Will it be a legacy of love, of hope? What can each of us do this year, this month, that will reverberate through lifetimes and change the course of history? We have been working and waiting with expectancy for nearly 50 years. And now suddenly, we're at a watershed, a turning point moment in our state houses with all the laws we're passing to protect life. In our courts, with the, with the seat on the Supreme Court that's been filled by Justice Amy Coney Barrett and with Roe v. Wade at a tipping point, and in the hearts and minds of the American people. Women don't need abortion, deserve better than abortion, and every day are choosing a better life than what the abortion industry is peddling. And here again, I think of of Justice Amy Coney Barrett, the, the living legacy of what women can accomplish while being a wife and mom, while raising a family, rising to the very top of the legal profession, all while giving her all at home. Thank you, Lord, for women like ACB. But we must end abortion and we must end the reign of Planned Parenthood with the gospel, with strategy, with excellence, and most of all, with love. This is the greatest humanitarian effort in history. We are at a moment of reflection and a moment where we can see true victory in the US. And I believe that that will be the turning point for the rest of the world. 
we will respect human dignity in our lifetime, but we can only do it by uniting in solidarity across the globe. Pro-life advocates from every corner of the world locking arms in pursuit of the one thing that we all intrinsically share, the human image and rights endowed to us by the one who made us. We can do it and we will see victory together. Thank you. Wasn't sure if I unmuted properly, but I was overwhelmed by your words today and, and what a brilliant, brilliant um, talk for us to have as we're preparing uh, for this year's pro-life march and this year's 12 month plan for our pro-life efforts. I think um, I could echo your comments about Amy Comey Barrett in regard to yourself. I mean, what you've done, where you've uh, risen in the legal profession and what you're doing today is, is quite incredible. And I was very excited to see your children right there uh, grabbing the cereal I would have loved to had this morning, but I'm not allowed to. And uh, and listening to your story, I can certainly understand and respect why you've been drawn to your current career and your devotion is, um, is, is amazing. And I, I think, and I echo what you've said at the state level. I know here in Ohio, um, we've had a lot of, uh, a lot of movement on the uh, pro-life front um, in regard to um, recently um, the laws uh, requiring a cremation or burial of, uh, of an aborted uh, child. So great words. Uh, we appreciate everything you said. And we're going to open up the questions here in a minute. So to our attendees out there in, um, in the Zoom land, um, if you raise your hand, you'll come to the top of the list. And uh, when we're done with a few panel questions, we will open up questions to our guests. But at this time, I want to, want to uh, welcome and uh, hear some comments and some questions from our national president for our Ladies Ancient Order Hibernians, Karen Kane from Albany, New York. Karen. Thank you very much, Danny. And um, Catherine, I was very, very impressed by everything that you said, and especially hot feeling ha of your personal experience. And I think that that makes you an excellent spokesperson for this event. Um, and, and the way you laid it out was very clear and understanding. In the LAOH, we want to know what we can do on the entire pro-life and especially like last week, a woman in the state of Indiana who committed a horrendous crime was executed. Um, and we as Catholics have to take pro-life to the beginning and to the end. So do you have any suggestions for us on how we can help with the whole spectrum of pro-life issues, um, what we can do, even though we on um, the ladies are a 501c3 about the um, execution because a lot of times people say pro-life when they're really anti-abortionist and they don't expand to the whole entire pro-life which is even the nursing homes and and competent care for them so what suggestions do you have for us to um to make it a f our members fully aware of the whole entire issue absolutely you know we work at americans united for life on the full spectrum of life. We, um, we address all of those threats to life that we see, including denial of medical care and euthanasia. And in fact, I was just up very late last night working on a denial of medical care case, trying to, uh, trying to help out the family of a 73-year-old of a gentleman who um, the hospital is, is taking some really untoward measures. Um, this is a, an area, life is an area that impacts all of us, and it is all of our responsibility to stand for life and to be consistent in that across the full spectrum. And that means different things for all of us. You know, all of us were different parts of the body, and so um, there's no one prescriptive method for every person to stand for life other than just that advocacy and openness. But for some people, it may be, you know, giving a of time and talents through, um, through volunteering. For some people, it may be prayer. Um, we need people at the state houses. We need people coming out when there's any kind of bill that impacts life at, at any point in the spectrum. Um, just being there, being a presence, wearing the color, if there's a color that everyone's wearing that day or 
So there'll be a sticker that you put on, uh, you put on your blouse or your shirt and, and you just come out and stand for life, maybe testifying. You know, it's usually, usually pretty short. You get about three minutes, but just sharing your heart um, can mean so much because the lawmakers know that for every person who shows up um, to their office, for every person who writes an email or a letter, or gives a call or, or actually shows up at a hearing, that there are at least a thousand more who were just busy being caretakers or, um, or working or just running the household or all of the different things that we're called to do, right? And so, um, you know, for some of us, it may be in our parish or our church, um, just being a, a safe place, a, a sounding board, a listening ear for someone who, um, who's in a difficult situation at any point along the life spectrum, whether dealing with an unplanned pregnancy or, um, or maybe considering adoption or maybe know how to handle a nursing home situation and and how to best stand for life and in all of those different areas um there are so i would just say so many different ways that we all can be a witness for life and um and i'm, I'm happy to brainstorm more I, I personally have a list that i keep and sometimes i share when i get to, to talk even a bit longer i'm a lawyer uh, i can go for hours and hours talking about a subject that i'm passionate about um, but those are just a few of the ways, you know, writing an op-ed, um, providing that public witness, coming out to a state house, and just being present in your neighborhoods, your communities, your workplaces, um, and your parishes, just being known as a safe place for life, as an advocate, someone who will stand for life and, and try to find the resources that people need to support them as they do the right thing. Many of our divisions, um, because of our tax, five, being a 501c3, um, we don't like lobby and we know we can march, um, things like that, but makes it uncomfortable for a lot of our members. So what we've been finding is a lot of our members are very, very active in supporting young women who made the choice to keep their child. Mm -hmm. And that's been a, an excellent way for us to practice our, um, our belief in pro-life. You made the choice, we're here to help you. We're, we're here to help you get an education. We're here to help you find, you know, network for jobs and stuff like that. So I think that sometimes, you know, everybody approaches it at a different, from a different side, like you said, different angle. So I just wanna, again, thank you so much for everything that you that you are doing, that your, that your organization is doing. I don't wanna say your company, but you know, your firm. And we really appreciate it. And, and thank you again for sharing. And I appreciate that. I'm gonna hand this back to Danny for the next question. And if I could just add a couple more things really quickly, um, following on what you said, um, absolutely, we need to um, to be supporting our sidewalk counselors, going out and, and sidewalk counseling ourselves and supporting the local pregnancy centers in any way that, that we can support the women directly. Uh, I love that you all with your groups and organizations are, are just reaching women where they are and saying, we're going to help you with your education and all of those things. Um, that's absolutely critical because, you know, once women make the choice for life, it's sometimes they think, what next? <laughs> now what? How do, I, how do I do this? And so um, that is just wonderful that, um, that you're st standing there in the gap for them and supporting them, coming alongside them. Thank you. Thank you. Well, great words from our uh, national president for the ladies, Karen Keene, as usual. Uh, we, we expect that from you, Karen. Uh, you've done such a great job on all these. And the two of you made me think, I know it was big in New Jersey years ago, uh, where they had um, these large baby bottles at the stores where people could give donations and that would help the uh, young mothers who uh, made the choice for life and needed some um, assistance, whether it was buying diapers, buying food, um, the basics. And, and that tremendous program, I believe it's still going on. Um, and if it's not, Larry Squires will be looking into it as soon as I send him an email today. But we're gonna go from our national vice president back to Larry for questions. And then we're gonna bring in Tim O'Brien, one of our guests. Any guests on the call today, if you raise your hands, we're gonna elevate you to a panelist. So when you do get on, we'll ask that you, uh, when it's you're called on, to make sure you unmute your microphone and uh, turn on your video. So uh, Tim will follow Larry. And next up from the Garden State, our National Vice President, Sean Pender. Thank you, uh, Danny. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Catherine, uh, uh, thank you so much for that great presentation. Uh, I had the uh, 
great um, opportunity to also be on that Irish uh, pro-life call. And uh, as soon as we got off with Danny, Danny was like, yes, we have to get Catherine to speak to our group. Um, I commend you for your, your tremendous work, your passion in this, and um, God bless you for what you do. Um, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, you didn't have a, um, unfortunately, uh, any idea where to turn to or where to get that non-judgmental type of call and help. I'm only a father today. Thanks that there was a brave, very brave 17 year old girl who was able to make a call. Uh, I'm an adoptive father. And um, that's why sometimes it gets emotional for me uh, because I also know there were so many other people that are out there that uh, were never blessed with children and um, adoption is a real option. Uh, there's someone on the call I know out there, John, uh, John Hughes from New Jersey, who's dedicated his, his life to the pro-life um, and he saved so many of the unborn by just getting into a, a, to offer uh, an option um, to have these women and, and young girls, younger women, sometimes um, given the opportunity to have a, 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 a um, to go to get the view. Uh, and he saved so many, many lives. And, and John has just been a hero of mine. Um, but I think you're, you're, you're right that it's, this is about winning hearts and minds and establishing a policy of life. I, I think it's very hypocritical that we have supposedly one party that's 100% pro-life and one party that's 100% pro, pro-death. It doesn't seem to make, make sense. It's, it's coming down up, up to politics. And I think part of this is that, uh, unfortunately, they want to pr pr promote that abortion is a uh, woman's reproductive health. It, Abortion is as far from women's reproductive health as that you can get. And when New York passed that nine months law to see people in the, 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 the Senate or Congress of uh, New York and Albany applauding was reprehensible. But unfortunately, we have that right now coming out in New Jersey. So I would ask, if, is there anything you could share with us, maybe some type of templates that we could use and maybe in New Jersey start sending it into our legislators to say, no, you're, you're wrong. This is nothing. I mean, nine month abortion is murder. Uh, it, it doesn't make any type of sense. So maybe that's something you could give us a little direction of here um, that we could try to get it out to, to our members, uh, our men and ladies, and, and to like-minded people. You, you, you know probably well, very well Chris Smith, who's the leading voice in Congress for it. Uh, luckily, he's my congressman, and he's he's been a big advocate of also. So maybe there's something we can do. But um, you know, a any help you could get with this, I, I think we could mobilize our folks in New Jersey to do some of the things you talked about, Karen. To just stand up to maybe go to testify or at least emails or calls. But um, again, thank you for your your life work. You are one of the true heroes, and it's uh, an honor to listen to you. And, and I, I hope the kids didn't spill any more cereal. So. Thank you. I, I don't think so, but honestly, I haven't looked over to check, so <laughs> we'll find out later. Um, it, it is absolutely an, an honor to, to join all of you. Um, likewise, all of you are heroes just by being on this call today, and, um, and I'm just so grateful for your witness and your efforts. Um, when it comes to New Jersey and any other state, we um, freely share our 60 model bills, our testimony, uh, talking points, efforts, ideas, um, all of that we have in terms of how to either fight for a bill or fight against a bad bill. We would be delighted to share all of that with you. So maybe we could touch base after the call and um, love to work with you. Thank you very much. Well, those are uh, great comments for us. And uh, Sean, I could echo that we are all blessed with your son, with your son Tig. And as days like today, we, uh, we count on TIG to make sure Sean can get online and, uh, <laughs> and, and get to events like this. And he's just, uh, uh, I've seen him enough. He's uh, really, we've all watched him as Hibernians grow from a, from, from a young boy to a young man. And um, I know how, Sean pr how proud Sean is, and, and that's absolutely wonderful. Uh, we'll move back to Larry Squires, our uh, pro-life chairman. Oh, thank you, Danny. And uh, <clears throat> also, thank you very much, Catherine. Your, your witness and testimony was uh, spectacular, I, I have to say. I'm, I'm very, very moved. Um, and and I, I wanted to uh, comment. 
Um, you, you obviously have a lot of uh, communication with sidewalk counselors and also uh, sidewalk prayer vigils, uh, which, you know, I tell people, if you want to learn about abortion, go pray in front of one, um, because it, it doesn't do you justice to read about it or to, to, to even see videos. But when you actually, I, I tell people it's like going to the Grand Canyon and trying to tell somebody about it. When you actually see the things that are happening, uh, you know, you see a UPS truck pull up in front of the abortion clinic and they're picking up uh, styrofoam containers. Uh, you know, there, there, there's a, pretty much only one thing that can be in that container. I, I mean, it's gruesome uh, to see what goes on and to see the, uh, some of the sites around it, uh, to, to, you know, uh, to be attacked verbally and sometimes physically by people who, who have a, take offense with you being there praying. And uh, I, I, I have so many thoughts. I mean, I, 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 I just uh, have trouble focusing, but, uh, you know, I, I do try to promote uh, 40 Days for Life and for people to join uh, prayer vigils. And the one comment that, that, uh, that I've heard uh, repeatedly is, especially from abortion workers who, uh, who convert and uh, come over to the other side, uh, they also have some very powerful witness and uh, several of them say that uh, just the presence of a prayer vigil in front of the abortion clinic interferes with our business up to 70%. And I, I think that you mentioned the plummeting rate of abortion, and uh, that kind of coincides with uh, the, uh, the organized prayer vigils set up by 40 Days for Life and uh, how, you know, people, people actually feel guilty that you can't be there you know, after you after you've done a couple hours uh, for a, for a Lenten vigil or a fall vigil, you, you wind up feeling guilty that you have to go to work and you can't be there to help out all the time. And uh, it, it's just such a rich and, and a rewarding experience. And uh, I, I just wondered if you had any additional comments about the uh, the people that stand those prayer vigils and the counselors. Absolutely. I would just say that everyone who, um, who participates in a prayer vigil, who sidewalk counsels, who is there on the front lines for the women, the girls, the partners in difficult circumstances, they are absolutely heroes going out and braving the, the rain and the snow and the wind and the cold and the heat and, you know, you name it, they are out there and that's exactly what we need. We know that that, that causes uh, a drop in the abortion rate. It, it offers hope to the women and girls who need it most and at the time and place that they need it most. And just, just being able to stand there in love and offer support and care and resources and information, um, that's what I needed. And that's, that's what I didn't get. There was no one there in front of that abortion facility. If there had been, if someone had reached out to me, um, I grew up in a Christian home. I, I would have, um, I would have stopped. I would have said, you know, you're praying, tell me more. And, um, and there was no one there. So I, I just, I, again, I know firsthand the difference that that would have made for me. And so I know how it's impacting the women and the girls now. So many who may not even make an appointment in the first place or may turn around, may end up choosing life. Um, many that you may not even know, <laughs> that you may not ever meet this side of heaven, but, um, but you're making a difference and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. God bless. I just want to echo uh, what I've said so many times in our meetings. Uh, Larry has uh, taken our pro-life efforts to a new level. Uh, since uh, his appointment in uh, July. And we so appreciate your work, Larry. It's uh, keep it up and, and uh, we, we will get better and better and fight harder and harder every day. Uh, Tim O'Brien, if you unmute, tell us where you're from and the floor is yours. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm Tim O'Brien. I'm from Pittsburgh. I'm from Division One, Allegheny County, Pittsburgh. And uh, Sorry about the camera. I, I just signed on before here and found out my external camera is not working. So I'm going to have to figure that out. But uh, but we'll go. You're you're actually I'm doing you a favor by not having my, uh, my face. <laughs> We're fine. <laughs> with that. 
Uh, Catherine, I, I have to say it's appropriate that, thank you for, first of all, for, for being with us today. And it's appropriate that your kids like Lucky Charms cereal. Uh, yes. That was fitting for the call. Uh, my question is pretty simple. You, you talked about humanization and I'm curious when you, if you could tell us any particular anecdote or story in your experience or things that you've heard of, was there ever like a light bulb moment or a story where you were able to crack that, that barrier and humanize the baby for somebody that right prior to that story didn't see it as a human? Goodness, there are so many examples of that. Um, some of it would be personal experience. I would just I would just even point to ultrasounds and how they have grown so much in prevalence and popularity over the last decades um, from the point where they weren't really used. And so um, we didn't really have that window to the womb to now when it's so common to even go get a 4D ultrasound in addition to the medical ultrasounds and just have that video saved and preserved where you can share with siblings and family members um, that this is, this is a, a real human being in the womb. Um, one story I would want to share is, um, is back when I was in law school, I was involved in just about every um, extracurricular group you could find, plus working 35 hours a week doing pro-life work and, and so many other things. But two of the things that I did were I was editor-in-chief of the student newspaper, the weekly student newspaper, and I was president of the parents club and, um, and I was president of the pro-life group. So you put all that together and I was publishing a lot of information about um, being pro-life and the pro-life message and about parenting. And one of my other editors, um, I forget wh which section he was editing, but one of the editors who was a libertarian, he came to me one day and he said, Catherine, you know, I, I have never really thought much about abortion or the life issue, um, but seeing you have this, um, and we kind of talked about this a little bit, a little bit earlier, but talking about the consistency, um, not only supporting children um, in the womb and mothers before they give birth, but then also being president of parents group and advocating for, um, for protections for parents on campus and law school, because that was, uh, that was its own experience from being a mom during law school. Um, he just, it, that really hit home for him that, um, that we, the pro-life movement, don't just care about abortion, although we certainly very much do, don't just care about children before they're born, but really do care about the full spectrum of life and, and are willing to provide that kind of support. And so that's what changed his mind on life. Um, that it's the experience of so many of us that's that's what we stand for but um but so many people believe what what the caricatures are in the news media and and they don't get it until they really talk with us um other times i have just shared stories of my own um my own children my own pregnancies um the the times when, um, when you maybe feel them kick or the ultrasounds or just facts about children in the womb. And actually, if you don't mind, I'm gonna bring in, I, I saw a, a question pop up on q and I'd like to include this in this response. Um, and that question, if, if you don't have it up, was when Roe v. Wade was decided, the justices all had no substantive evidence when life starts. Now that science can truly define life, does that make it possible? for the current Supreme Court um, to change the course of, of abortion proliferation? Does it, for example, allow pro-life to more easily flourish and allow local lawmakers to get, um, to get common sense around the abortion industry changed as you described? Does it stop government support of abortion? Can it finally reverse Roe v. Wade? Um, and I would say in brief that the scientific evidence has always been there. You look over the decades at embryology textbooks and they're clear about when life begins. It begins at fertilization. Um, and that was an argument that the state of Texas made in Roe v. Wade. The problem was that we had these seven justices who, um, who were listening more to these equivocations and they didn't follow the science even then. Since then, as we know, science has gotten better and better. 
They've gotten more and more information and proof about life in the womb with the ultrasounds, with all of the different um, different interventions with um, with prenatal surgery and all of the ways that we can impact life in the womb. Um, so it, there are there are so many ways to to share, um, and every way can make a difference. So when I'm having a conversation, I just um, start talking and. Um, and see how people are responding and, um, and see what seems to be impacting them and then answer their questions and follow down that trail because um, you know people are, are hungry for information about life. They have questions. Generally, they like science. They want transparency. They want consistency. And that's all what, what we can provide because we are on the side of justice and the side of truth. And um, to coin a phrase, the right side of history. Well, thank you. Uh, another another great answer. Uh, as we prepare to go to John O'Dwyer from Louisville, Chris, uh, when John's uh, when this is next segment is complete, if there's anything from um, YouTube, any questions that we need to bring forward, and then we'll go back to the uh, questions with the hands up. John, uh, thank you, Worthy. Uh, just want to say thank you to you and all the other leaders and guests uh, for really bringing this to the forefront. I think these webinars and having people be able to engage this way has captured more people than in the past. This has not been a secondary item for us at all, but I think the more engagement we have, the better. So thank you very much. And uh, Catherine, it couldn't be more perfect that your kids walked in in this discussion. <laughs> That was awesome. <laughs> I love seeing that. So never apologize. That was great. Um, I, I just, I like when I get into discussions about right to life, obviously we believe it's not just an abortion issue, but I also like to talk to people and know what their thinking is and their reasons. And I use that term loosely. Uh, and one of them that's come up is really the hypocrisy behind this pro-abortion discussion is we talked about when does life begin and you still have states that if a pregnant woman is murdered, they are allowed to be charged twice for the unborn child. So there is some recognition uh, in states about whether that's life or not life. But when you come into a discussion about abortion, that kind of gets pushed to the side. The other piece is it's a woman's right to choose. It's her body, it's a medical procedure, and I'll use something that's very prevalent today. We have COVID and we have a vaccine coming out. There's a lot of discussion whether that's going to be a mandatory item, a mandatory medical procedure for people uh, that you have to do. But in the, the case of comparison, if a woman has the right to kill a child, how can you possibly also hypocritically say you have to take a vaccine that may or may not work, and I'm not gonna get into the specifics of that, but there's a hypocrisy there when it comes to this medical reasoning. And how do we approach that, or how have you seen that approach that, where you really get a lot of hypocrisy in the discussion and do it, and we have to do it in a way that we're kind, we listen, we're empathetic, but we have to win the hearts and minds. I'll turn it back to you, thank you. Thank you. Um, that's exactly right. First of all, I would say that most states uh, do have a law that says that um, that if a pregnant woman is um, is murdered, abused by her partner, and and it results in the death of her child, that um, that you can prosecute for the child's death. Now, in some states, um, that may be from from a point other than fertilization. Um, for example, in my own state, it's, um, it's from the point of viability. We've seen that that has created real problems in consistency in the law. There's, um, there's one story in particular of a, of a young woman who was murdered by her partner. And, um, and in large part, it was because of the fact that she was pregnant. Um, her child was 15 weeks along. And so her family wasn't able to get justice for their grandbaby and they were heartbroken. Um, pro-choice even, uh, at least part of the family was pro-choice, but, but they said, this isn't right. You know, even if you want to equivocate on, um, on <clears throat> wanted or something like that, that this was undeniably a wanted child. And, um, 
and we want justice, we demand justice. And so then they've been, they've been um, active in trying to, trying to change the law here. Um, all too often women are targeted in large part in, in, in many cases because of their pregnancy. And, um, and we also see that some states are fighting back even against that. For example, New York. In New York now, if, if a child is killed in the, in the commission of a crime against a woman, that there can't be justice. And in fact, I, I'm part of a team that just a few days ago, um, just last week, filed a lawsuit seeking to, um, seeking to overturn that New York law, that law that, um, that lit up the Empire State Building pink and that everyone was applauding in the streets. Um, just horrible, tragic um, law with, I would say unforeseen consequences, but we did foresee them. We testified about that and, um, and yet this law got passed. Um, when it comes to the, sort of the, the inconsistencies that we see, these um, ethical and moral inconsistencies where of course we, um, we, we support life and, um, and we believe that, um, that women should be making life affirming life. Is, um, that's just, a, again, I believe about meeting people where they are. And so often I get questions, well, I have a friend who, um, uh, who is pregnant and, and what would you tell her that she can't get an abortion? Um, that kind of thing. And, and so for me, I, I personalize it. I say, you know, I've been there, I've walked in those shoes. Here's what I needed. Here's what would have helped me. The more that we tell stories and personalize it, the more that we show that empathy and caring and offer resources and better solutions and sometimes even throw in a statistic, sometimes talking about the real reasons why women choose abortion, which um, even, in, even when it comes to late-term abortions, it's not the reasons that the abortion industry says. Their own studies tell us it's the exact same reasons for the most part in almost every case as first trimester abortions. It's about um, you know not having enough money. It's about uh, maybe a relationship with the father, relationship issues. It's about not feeling ready to be a parent. And all of those are areas where we can come alongside women and support women and girls. And, um, and so it's just about being consistent ourselves, standing for life um, in, in all its, its iterations and, um, and protecting the people around us. Thank you. That's uh, another, uh, your comments and your words you use are just absolutely incredible, uh, absolutely perfect. Um, folks, Chris, where, do we have any questions uh, coming to us uh, via the, uh, the YouTube? Hearing none, we're going to move on. And I would ask everyone to move right to their question uh, moving forward. We've got, um, I'd like to try and get everyone who has their hands up now in, and we don't want to take too much, uh, too much more of your time here. So we'll go ahead to John if you un un unmute your videos on, John Kalia. Thank you, Danny. Uh, thank you again, Catherine, for joining us. God bless you for your work. I'm, I'm actually in my car. Uh, we had a mass for life with our bishop at our cathedral here in Raleigh, North Carolina this morning, and I'm uh, about to attend the uh, rally in March for Life uh, in downtown Raleigh. I'm parked outside the legislation building here. Uh, the lieutenant governor, who was re recently elected as a, as a pro-life lieutenant governor, but unfortunately our governor here is uh, a pro-abortion governor. And my question is this, there was a, there was a bill the legislature passed uh, to ban infanticide, uh, but the governor vetoed that. And then the legislature didn't have enough votes to overturn that. Do you have any advice on working with uh, a pro-abortion legislature, maybe on just a specific issue like this, or just in general, um, how do you suggest any resources, advice on working, uh, trying to work and influence the pro-abortion legislator. Right. You know, we work in all 50 states. So we come across um, your question, your issue pretty frequently, unfortunately. Uh, love to see the pro-life gains. But even when you are working in a state uh, or with a legislature or with a governor who is uh, on the other side, who is pro-abortion, we can still make inroads because you know, when, when they're passing these kinds of radical pro-abortion bills, as in New York, 
they're not listening to their constituents. The vast majority of, um, of even pro-choice people, of even, um, of even the, the pro-choice Democrats, they oppose these kinds of bills. And so we can make inroads when it comes to late-term abortions, when it comes to infanticide, when it comes to funding. Uh, some of these areas um, where it, it seems like it should be common sense. Now, they're going to get lobbied um, by other people as well. And those other people may, um, may not share our viewpoint and may try to sway them. And it sounds like that's exactly what happened in your case with your governor in North Carolina. I would have to check with my team and, and refresh myself on the, the full story there. But, um, but we can just continue to, to do outreach, find the connections, build the bridges. You know, If you know someone who knows the governor, you know someone who knows someone, how many degrees of separation there are, you know, we can reach people and share these kinds of stories. And I'm thinking also about, um, uh, about a couple of effects that you learn about. And, and I, I talk about them a lot in the context of, um, of euthanasia and of suicide by physician. Um, in, in so many cases, as we've seen recently, our medical profession, the, the profession that we depend upon to, um, to heal us and comfort us and care for us, it's been, um, it's been twisted. Um, when it comes to abortion, euthanasia, suicide by, by, by physician. And, um, and I just wanted to, to let you know, Marilyn, I, I read your comment over in the Q&A as well. And, um, and it's, it's devastating that you would be denied a position due to your beliefs. That's, it's wrong um, legally and morally. Um, and in fact, most, most healthcare providers believe in health. We saw that in DC with, um, with suicide by, by physician. And we saw that um, there are um, about 11,000 physicians who are licensed to practice medicine in DC. Once they passed suicide by physician here a couple of years ago, you had to register. And if you wanted to be eligible to provide those drugs, uh, prescribe those drugs. And in the first year of, um, of eligibility, um, of, of that law being passed, only two doctors signed up and zero patients actually accessed that law. So you see just the, the infinitesimal percentage of even doctors who support these kinds of, of life ending measures. Um, so, you know, what we need to do is just continue to, to do outreach, to continue to, um, to use the, um, the good people in the medical profession to share their point of view. We need to continue to, um, to build hope and to share what, um, what life-giving alternatives there are and, um, and just try to get through to, um, to all of the lawmakers and the governors who, um, who, maybe are, um, who maybe need some more education on this issue. Okay, it looks like we might have missed, have a little bit of a uh, technical issue with Danny. Um, thanks, Chris, for letting us know. But I believe we have uh, Biagio Wallace. Can you hear me, Biagio? Yes, sir. Okay. You're, uh, How y'all doing? Up. Thank you very much. Uh, just one quick question. You're talking about states and how you get, you know, get a change. I'm from West Virginia. And uh, Catherine, you know what we've gone through. Uh, and this year, or this year, 2020, we, we did it, you know, boom, no abortions after uh, 20 weeks. And unbelievable, where we got the support was not from our ex-Catholic bishop, but it was from the grassroots of the, of the, of the Catholics in this state. And, uh, you know, that's something I'm really concerned about because you had a lot of bishops that aren't vocal on the abortion issue. So Catherine, uh, is there any way you see it? We had to boot the guy out. I mean, we, we had a revolution here and he's gone and he's, he's back in Philadelphia. If you find him, tell him I said hi. But that's it. If Catherine, do you have any ideas on how these other states can do it if they have clerical adversity? Yeah, absolutely. It is tough. And I have a lot of good friends in West Virginia. I applaud your efforts there. It has been 
game changing. And I, I am just, uh, I'm delighted that you're on the call here today. Uh, we, we run into this issue a lot with, uh, with bishops and, um, and, and others who aren't really, really willing to make that stand for life. And um, it's maybe a little bit different than it is with governors, but in many ways it is similar because even when all their constituents, all the vast majority, super majority of the people who even voted them into office don't agree with them on a radical pro-abortion stance, even when they're um, just listening to, um, to lobbyists, to Planned Parenthood lobbyists and others, they don't want to, um, to make any kind of divisive stand. And so I think it is about sharing with them that this is, um, it's a church issue. It's an issue where, um, where the, the church has been crystal clear that this is um, a, a grievously important issue for, um, for all Catholics to make a stand. It's also um, a winning issue. It's an issue that the vast majority of Americans will stand alongside them and will support life especially when it comes to things like abortion funding, like late-term abortion, like um, infanticide, like protections um, for children who are, uh, <clears throat> who are born alive or who are capable of feeling pain. And, and at times when, um, when it's so much more dangerous and even deadly for the mother, um, most Americans agree on that. And so the more we just, um, we're present ourselves, the more that we uh, build up the um, the respect life offices and um, and just share the truth about life. Sometimes some may need to be booted. <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna gonna lie there, but um, but I think that we can reach people and we can encourage people to make that critical stand for life and to lead their flock in the way that they should. Thank you, uh, Biagio, for that. Uh question and, and thank you echo uh catherine's comments for the great work that you've done in west virginia hopefully it's something that we can uh, copy um uh, throughout the country um moving okay danny you're you're back uh, with us you yes know, the, the gremlins and, uh, great work sean that's why uh we yeah. have so many people on and chris cook uh i actually am at the university so i wouldn't have those problems today and here i am with the internet problem but paul o'neill if you'll unmute and tell us yeah. where you're from and Give us your question. Yes, good morning, everybody. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm Paul O'Neill. I'm a member of the Mark Heffernan Division here in Akron, Ohio. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background, perhaps to put the, my question in context, I was born and raised in Ireland. I've only been living in America for 10 years. So trying to learn a little bit more about American legislation and history as it pertains to the subject. Um, I'm very hopeful that with Amy Coney Barrett appointed to the Supreme Court that the tide will change a little bit. But my understanding is that with when Roe versus Wade was before the courts, there was a 6-3 Republican majority. When Planned Parenthood versus Casey was before the courts, it was an 8-1 Republican majority. And typically those were under pro-life presidents. Um, are we or am I hoping for too much that things will change? Yeah, um, I do believe that Roe v. Wade will be overturned. Um, but you don't have to take my word for it because um, now... Two falls ago, um, it was fall of 19, back when we were allowed to meet in person, um, I was on stage in Philadelphia at the National Constitution Center. And I was debating um, the woman who argued Planned Parenthood v. Casey and, um, and a, a law professor down in Florida who is um, uh, pr pretty pro-abortion. And they both said on stage in front of the audience and live streamed, we had live streaming even back then, um, they said that this, this then, um, this is pre Amy Coney Barrett, this is the Supreme Court that will overturn Roe v. Wade. I take that with a bit of a grain of salt. You know, they're speaking to their constituents, they're trying to rev up the base and encourage people to fight back and um, wave coat hangers and that sort of thing. Just grotesque. Um, but you also see, um, you see fear, um, you see concern from the uh, abortion activists. Um, back probably two and a half, three years ago, before Justice Kennedy retired, um, NARAL, NARAL Pro-Choice America, sent out an email and the subject line was, not a drill, Roe v. Wade in danger. Um, the president of NARAL, 
one time back when we could do the March for Life. She got out of, uh, out of the Metro train, um, public transit at Union Station in DC, a couple of blocks from the Supreme Court and was met with this wave of, um, of pro-life advocates holding signs, talking excitedly, standing for life. And her comment was, there are so many of them. There are so many of them and they're so young. So I believe that we are changing the hearts and minds of the nation. Now there's a lot of research on the presidency and how that impacts the abortion rate. You may have seen charts, okay? Abortion goes down under, um, under presidents of one political party and up under um, presidents of the other political party and it's not what you would think, it's the opposite. Well, in large part, that's because of Supreme Court picks. In large part, that's because you don't make that much change in the presidency. You make change um, when the president appoints justices and other federal judges. And so it takes years to see the effects of that because you see the change at the state level, passing these state level laws, then they have to filter up, percolate up through the courts. And then eventually they get to the court where they're either upheld or overturned by the judges and justices that that president from a few years ago actually put into, um, put into place, um, actually appointed. So, um, so it, it takes time to see that, to see that change. Uh, when it comes to justices, to be honest, there have been many times when we've been disappointed um, with, uh, with justices and other judges that we've picked. And that goes both ways um, to a certain extent but certainly we've been disappointed when um, a judge or a justice who we thought was going to stand strong for life and for the constitution, who seemed to be an originalist and a textualist and, and to think that the, to understand that the constitution is their highest calling and duty, um, then suddenly seemed to throw that out the window. And, um, and it's, it's been concerning when we've seen that happen, but, um, but we are seeing progress on the court, I believe. Um, it's always hard to know, but, but even just in this last year with the June Medical Services case, when we saw, um, you know, back in 92, we had the Planned Parenthood v. Casey case, and that opened the door for more and more state protections. And at 2016, we had the Hellerstedt case at the Supreme Court, and that was um, devastating. It, it basically said that if a woman does tragically choose to get an abortion and something goes wrong, as we know all too often it does, that she doesn't get the same right to medical care as she would with any comparable procedure. Um, devastating. And I think maybe even especially for women like myself who've, um, who've been personally impacted by that, it felt like a slap in the face. Um, 2020, it, it brought confusion <laughs> um, in some ways. The June Medical Services case, it upheld um, it followed that 2016 Hellerstedt case um, in striking down the Louisiana law that, um, that had, um, it was very similar to the Texas law, um, different impact, which was important under the Hellerstedt case, um, because Hellerstedt basically said that instead of um, trusting the lawmakers, that they were making an important decision, that they were trusting the facts and relying on the facts to make a, a good judgment for their community, it said, well, we're going to have to, to balance. Is this, is this law a net positive or a net negative? Is it going to help or hurt women more? Instead of trusting the lawmakers on the helping part and just, um, what harms there might be. Last year, we got that rule back to the Casey standard. So now we're back to a point where we're trusting lawmakers and we're seeing courts throughout our nation including in Missouri, including in Pennsylvania, including in many other states, federal courts relying on Chief Justice Roberts' opinion, which is controlling, to uphold pro-life laws. And, um, and we're, seeing, we're seeing lawsuits being dropped, lawsuits that would attack pro-life laws. So we are seeing hope. Uh, we don't know what will happen when the next Roe v. Wade comes up to the Supreme Court. And of course the Supreme Court can overturn Roe v. Wade with any case touching on abortion. Uh, we also know that when they do overturn Roe v. Wade that almost certainly the issue will go back to the states with some states passing more and more pro-life laws, some states going the direction of New York and the majority of states being somewhere in the middle. Some, um, some protections, but not to the extent of um, 
of some of some of the states that we've seen, um, like West Virginia. So um, in short, long story short, uh, I do believe that Roe v. Wade will be overturned. Um, I don't know when it will be. I think those who say this is the court, this is the year, um, I, I don't know that that's the case. But I do believe that we're going to see more and more pro-life laws upheld. We probably will see more setbacks in our future. But, um, but we're on the side of truth and of justice. And um, and uh, the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. So I believe that we're, we're making progress. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for uh, that question. Um, now we want to move on to uh, our, our next question from New Jersey, a, a great friend of mine, a man who I mentioned before, John Hughes, who's done some tremendous work and, and has, uh, has really stressed the ultrasound and has saved so many lives. Uh, John, it's been an honor to work with you over the years. He's in our new, been our New Jersey AOH uh, Right to Life Chair. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, John to uh, Catherine for his question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, or Vice President. I almost promoted you that time. <laughs> uh, Catherine, God bless you for your work. Um, and I love your name. That was my daughter's name. Um, I have a little bit of a different question for you. Um, you know, here in New Jersey in the last three years, we had uh, the opportunity to work with three separate women who had abortions. Um, a, a, one of the women was going for her second abortion. We were able to convince her not to have the abortion and to give the child up for adoption. Um, but in dealing with a lot of the women that we've had the opportunity to speak to, uh, post-abortion -abort reconciliation is a big deal for us, as it is for everybody. Um, and a lot of the women that we speak to tell us that they're not going to go or participate in Project Rachel simply because God will never forgive them. Um, and that has been a real big issue. Why do you think post-abortion abortive women feel that way? That's a really good question. Um, thank you for, for joining and thank you for your work and for working with the women. Um, that is just absolutely critical. Abortion is, um, and I've actually written a white paper that touches on this. Um, abortion is, it's a unique kind of a thing because it takes um, a role that is so intrinsically um, what so many women are called to and created for and twists that on its head. And, um, and so you take um, your body, which is supposed to be a, a safe space, a, a protection for life and for growth and, um, and turn it into a life ending space through, through a choice that you made. And so coming to grips with that is incredibly difficult. It's, um, it's intense, it requires a lot of self-examination, a lot of honesty, and um, it, it, it's, I can't even begin to tell you how difficult that is. Um, there are a couple of, of responses that women often have post-abortion. Um, one is to, to harden their hearts and to, um, to kind of turn off any emotion related to it, um, or even just to, to focus on anything positive and say, oh, well, the abortion was a good choice for me because it let me um, finish school, something like that. Um, and, and just only focus on that and not let themselves grieve and experience um, how that abortion actually impacted them. And so that's how you end up seeing so many people who are engaged in abortion activism. So many people have that personal experience and are trying to justify it. Um, other women are, um, you know, are, are just broken and, and try to confront it directly. And, and I was probably more on that side. Um, I, one of the reasons why I chose abortion in the first place was because I was terrified of telling my mom um, that I was in that situation. And um, she was she was a single mom and I was an only child and 
the idea of disappointing her was just overwhelming to me. I didn't know how to tell her. Uh, about a month after the abortion, because I am a mama's girl, I told her anyway. Um, and she, she grieved right alongside me, helped me find counseling at what it turned out was a pregnancy center. It took me years after that to figure that out really, but, um, but she helped me find counseling for it and, and helped me to work through that grief, um, more or less in real time. And that was a tremendous blessing in my life, but, um, but a lot of women don't get that. And so the work that you're doing is absolutely critical to help um, to help prevent repeat abortions and abortion recidivism, to help um, build a culture for life and, and create advocates for life and not advocates for death. Um, but why, why women react the way they do, it's, it's just, it, it has such an emotional impact and it, it tears at your heartstrings. And when you look at studies of how women are impacted after abortion, not only physically, um, we know many of the physical impacts and, and sequelae after abortion, but also psychologically and emotionally and mentally and spiritually, the impact is deep. And, um, and there have been studies on this, and sometimes you'll see headlines that say, um, oh, it, more women, women report that abortion helped them than hurt them. And, and when you see that, you want to dig into that study a little bit. And, and, and I'm... Maybe it's what I do. I, I love scientific studies. I love social science. I love digging in and finding out, you know, who was involved and, and what was the process? What was the method? Where was the failing? And when you see those kinds of studies, you can pretty easily pick out where the failing was. Um, one study in particular where the vast majority of women um, chose not to participate in the study. And you wonder, well, why wouldn't they? Well, maybe they were the ones who were hurting more. Maybe they were the ones who were in pain and didn't want to discuss how the abortion impacted them because it is hard to look at yourself in the mirror after a decision like that. And, um, and to know that, that the choice you made is going to have generational impact. Um, yeah, it's, we, we have to be there for these women and that's just what you're doing. Well, one of the things that we found was that we found scriptural um, leanings and teachings that we could sit and talk to the women regarding Christ's um, ability to forgive. Um, and he wants to forgive you. But it's difficult just to get them to that point to even sit and listen or even talk about it. So I fully understand what you're saying. Right. But I, from a, another perspective here in New Jersey, one of the agencies that we deal with here is Several Sources up in Ramsey, New Jersey. And they put out a film called Give Me Shelter. And it's on Amazon for anybody who wants to get it. Um, but we tried to distribute that to high schools, to, to women everywhere, or anybody who wants to see it to give them a, a basic idea of what's going on with the whole process. So we try to attack it on, an, on a number of levels. The one thing that's been my personal mantra, if you will, is that I know in the past we've had a bad habit of pointing fingers at women and saying, you committed an unforgivable sin. I don't believe in that. I believe that we should do what Christ did and try and to alleviate the sufferings of what, what actually transpired and talk to people. So um, different philosophy, but that's what we like to do. Absolutely. That is directly from the Bible, from the church's teachings um, that, that we can be forgiven. And, um, and that has been the greatest blessing in my life. Thank you, John, for your comments uh, from New Jersey. Um, Catherine, I know you saw in the Q&A Marilyn Madigan's comments, but they were so relevant that I um, asked her to come on and just share those comments so the rest of the group can hear them. Marilyn is our national Vice President for the Ladies' Ancient Order Hibernian, and she resides in Cle the great state of Ohio, Cleveland. I think they might have beat Pittsburgh last week, Larry. Go ahead, Marilyn. Catherine, yes, thank you very much for sharing your story. I was really um, very moved when you said that people held you down when you were changing your mind. I am a retired nurse, and I worked 
uh, three years in the pediatric intensive care unit at the beginning of my career. And then for the last remaining part of my career, I was a surgical nurse. And when I applied to go into surgery, I was a little naive. I did not realize that my hospital was doing abortions in the surgical area. So when we saw a DNC and an asterisk, we knew that that was gonna be a DNC or an abortion. And I went up to my boss and I said, I, I cannot do, I cannot participate in that procedure. And she said to me, um, we all have to do things we do not like. And I said to her, it's not that I like it, or do not like it. I do not believe in it. I cannot participate. And then she proceeded and I said, well, you, my reply to her was, maybe you should have thought about that before you hired so many of us from Irish or from a Catholic nursing school. So a few years later, I was in charge of the eye service and they were gonna move that ambulatory where all the abortions were being done. And we had to sign a, a form saying that we would participate. I could not sign that form. I went to the overall hospital because um, I was gonna grieve it because my, I could lose my position. And when I sat down, they're like, oh, you're Irish? Oh, you're Catholic? And they also then, when it went through, they budgeted it for, um, an operating room assistant as opposed to a nurse. And historically, it's a shame that they, they did that because when all this was happening was when the national convention was in Cleveland. So if I had a fight there, I would have had brothers and sisters from all over the country helping me and it could have helped this cause. But working in the OR, the nurse is your advocate. And up to the time that the anesthesia would start to give you your medicine to go to sleep. If at any time you say you're changing your mind, that nurse in that room would speak up and that procedure would not be done. So that's why I was appalled when they held you down, when something as drastic as ending somebody's life occurred. So thank you for working with all the legalities to give people the right to stand up as a, an advocate in all settings and to protect people in the healthcare profession from having to participate in these. And I know in Ireland, that was one thing they were gonna be forcing and I was really appalled at that. So thank you for all the good work you do. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, we appreciate you uh, coming on today. Uh, what we're going to do now is kind of go around for just some brief closing comments. I want to commend everyone who stayed with us on uh, today's call. Um, but I, I think it says uh, so much about your words today, Catherine, that um, the, we've had a, and the people who did leave sent us nice notes and we still have a nice crew out there on uh, YouTube. Uh, so uh, President Keene. Thank you, Danny. Um, I just want to say again, Catherine, thank you so much for, for sharing. And this, when you talked about what we can do as individuals, talking to someone, counseling them, befriending them, listening, advising them, every one of us can do that. And we can, we can stop this. We can educate others. And that's what I feel that was the best thing I'm taking away from this is I feel more empowered and more, um, knowledgeable about the whole issue. So I really, truly thank you. I wish our, our um, right to life person could be here, but she works in the state of California. So, but I just want to say thank you. And thank you for empowering us as individuals also. And in addition to us as organizations, thank you very much. And thank you, Karen, for your willingness to always participate in these events. Um, it really makes it a, a, a more well-rounded event. We'll move to Sean Pender. Thanks. Um... Mr. President and Catherine, again, thank you for all the great work you do. Look forward to working with you um, to hopefully win the hearts and minds uh, and create this pro, um, uh, pro-life pro uh, society. And uh, I just commend you again, uh, just the way that you conduct yourself 
and the positiveness that you promote exude. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's a dark subject, but the, the, the positiveness, you, you make people believe that we can change things. And I think that's a tremendous, tremendous gift. So thank you very much and look forward to working with you. Larry Squires. Uh, yes, <laughs> Catherine, I wanted to thank you once again. Uh, your, your testimony and witness was spectacular, as were your answers to your questions. And uh, <clears throat> I'd like to add that <clears throat> almost every time somebody finds out I'm a pro-life chair and, uh, you know, they, they, they present me with the straw man arguments for abortion, like uh, rape, incest, uh, financial, that type of thing. And uh, I, I really want to draw on what, what John mentioned about using Holy Scripture. And, uh, you know, I kind of turn the argument over to Jesus and, and say, you know, you, you, you don't have an argument with me, but, you know, this is what Jesus said. And uh, uh, I think that's, that's very effective because uh, it, it, not, not that it shuts them up, but you can just see them, you know, stop and you can hear the wheels turning in their head. And, uh, you know, I think the more that we plant seeds with these folks, uh, the, the more productive it is rather than, you know, trying to get into a head to head, uh, you know, as the Irish, we love to fight. And, uh, you know, that's kind of hard to control. Sometimes uh, you, you like to, you know, there's nothing like a good argument, you know, but, uh, but it's not productive, you know, it just steals their will, their will to, uh, to oppose or, or to, uh, you know, what their, what their uh, argument is. And, and I think it's so true that what you say that these lawmakers, uh, I think they're listening to the super PACs and not their constituents. And uh, that's a huge, huge problem in this country. And, uh, the, you know, Planned Parenthood, it, it's a vicious cycle. You know, the, the government gives Planned Parenthood money and, and Planned Parenthood gives the money to the super PACs. So it's, it's really uh, something that, that really we need to work on to change. But again, thank you. Thank you very much. And this has been uh, incredibly productive. And uh, thank you again, Mr. President, for uh, setting this up. Thank you so much. Appreciate your comments, Larry. Mo more importantly, I appreciate your work. Catherine, whenever I look at the list as we sign in early, and when, once I see Chris Cook sign in, I know everything's going to be okay. Chris is our state president from North Carolina, does a great job down there. And uh, him and I learned about Zoom one day, uh, Zoom webinars one day when we had to do our convention virtually. And uh, we actually had, uh, it was it was flawless. And I, I felt so good with uh, Chris on the call today. Uh, Chris, I you're, you're so involved down there in everything. I wanted to give you an opportunity to say a few words before we ended. Sure, um, I would just like to thank uh, Catherine uh, for all of your work, especially with the legislature um, that you've done. Um, getting the laws through. Um, and I'd also like to thank Larry uh, this year for really helping to organize the uh, pro-life committee and getting that group really working together. Um, there's a lot of uh, folks that have been working separately. Um, you know, in our state, North Carolina, John uh, spoke earlier, um, and he's such an advocate for the pro-life group. Um, and he's really enjoyed being able to work uh together with all the Hibernians nationally. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm saddened that I'm not able to be down at the uh, march uh, right now, but I, I, I know that John uh, is going to be uh, marching in about 15 minutes here. So thank, well, thank you, you Chris, for all you do. And, and Catherine, I just want to echo what everyone said. A brilliant, uh, brilliant discussion today. Brilliant presentation. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it a couple of times just so I could practice my uh, public uh, speaking delivery because you do such a wonderful job and and I was in in the in the uh, I echo what I think John mentioned earlier how great it was your uh, children popped into the uh, in that what what uh just the demonstrated love by the look on your face was incredible and I I'd invite you for any closing words and and then uh, we will close the meeting. I am just so grateful to all of you for um, for your stand for life, for taking time from your Saturday morning and afternoon to join this talk today. Um, this is an issue that impacts every American. This is an issue that every American can have an impact on. And when we come together and we stand for life, 
we can make the difference that we need to win because lawmakers listen to um, listen to us, listen to the people, listen to their constituents. Um, the more we turn up, the more that we are there on the front lines, whether it's uh, on the sidewalk outside an abortion facility, whether it's um, serving the women directly through, um, through a pregnancy center or through another ministry that's going to reach women directly and provide them with resources that we need, whether it's at the state house, um, writing op-eds or meeting with lawmakers or making phone calls, all of these are important. And most of all, prayer is important. So all of us can make a life-giving, a life-changing difference in the lives of, um, of the women of our communities and our nation. So um, God bless all of you. You are all heroes. And I hope to work with all of you in the future. Thank you again. Uh, God bless you and your family. Uh, brothers and sisters, this concludes our meeting uh, today. Our webinar with special guest, Catherine Glenn Foster, President and CEO of Americans United for Life. Uh, join us uh, for our future uh, virtual events. I, I hope someday we have Catherine return and uh, you set the bar pretty high.